Hello, my name is Alex Bain. I'm uh, with UC Berkeley. Uh, I want to thank uh, Monter, um, Ali, Asu for the invitation, and congratulations on the beautiful launch. Um, I thought what I would want to do over the next 10 minutes is to talk about one particular problem, which is, I think, very exemplary of uh, the type of things that we hope to see coming out of IDSS, especially because it links a lot of different fields that are common in, uh, in, in the world of urban planning and in the world of, uh, of big cities, people who do modeling, like in civil engineering, people who do game theory and, and who do control and optimization, like in EECS, people who do urban planning and people who do economics. So if you think about... Um, you know, we just heard about fiber, we heard about a lot of infrastructure. In the past decades, the um, uh, cities have owned their entire infrastructure and have operated it and have archived all the data and have been able to measure almost everything they wanted to know about urban mobility. And this ecosystem has been completely disturbed and, uh, and, and displaced over the last decade, leading to a lot of new problems and challenges that really are hard for the cities to face. Um, if you look at the growth of devices over the last decades, um, it's quite phenomenal that the Android line that starts around 2011 is nearly vertical, um, leading to a penetration of smartphones in the US, which is way above 100% because a lot of people have double devices and because cars are being connected and many other devices are being connected. Um, this has completely revolutionized transportation. Mostly because if you look at what happened in 2008, um, this left site is almost like what a vintage website would look like today. I mean, um, this is how people have been getting their information for decades. Um, within two years, due to the explosion of smartphones, everybody in this room has been able to get a smartphone with information on the left where I would say 99% of that information is produced by all of us. Now, that revolution, and I, I really love to quote Deborah Estrin on this because she's the one who saw this more than 10 years ago, and, and the quote I, I think is nearly exact. She came to Berkeley to give this very visionary talk about revealing the previously unobservable, um, has made transportation into something completely different, um, but has had a lot of impact on our mobility and will make it much easier for the government or for the public agencies to control, and that's really the core of the problems I'd like to talk about today. Um, just to give you a sense, um, we heard a lot about taxis. This is 500 taxis producing a GPS point every 30 seconds in San Francisco. Okay, this is yellow cab. Imagine, at the present time, Uber is probably operating 2,000 vehicles live in the city, and that's just a, of the, uh, a subset of the fleet of connected vehicles in the city. So th the, the, the truth is that this data um, dwarfs anything. This is what you get after playing the movie for a whole day. Um, this data dwarfs nearly anything that the government could deploy today to monitor traffic, to monitor supply, to monitor demand, to monitor practically everything that connects us um, together in our mobility patterns. And so this is very disruptive to the ecosystem. Um, we're going we're gonna to come close to a point where the entire population um, owns a smartphone and a ever-increasing majority of the population makes mobility choices supported by smartphones. Something that's never been modeled before, something that evolves faster than people can model uh, because this ecosystem is constantly changing. So think about the classical way of managing mobility that the government has been using for a while. The yellow box here, which says state estimation, is essentially what runs inside your phone. Everybody in this room can watch traffic in real time. That's new. That's relatively new. It's been only a few years. Before, people couldn't. So when people were doing demand prediction and system prediction, which is essentially thinking of what will, be, what will traffic be within the next couple of hours and how should we adjust the traffic lights to manage for it, it was essentially assuming static data because while you were on the road, you could not see what traffic looked like. Maybe you can listen to the radio, but essentially you, you were tied. There's no way you could make real-time decisions. That yellow box has enabled everybody to make real-time decisions, has enabled anybody to change their decisions from day after day, and because the information providers are also changing the way they collect that information and the way they, change, they produce that information, that has also generated further dynamic changes that are completely modifying the system all the time. So, for example, if you take the 210 corridor, which is a test bed we've been working on, right now there's probably about 350 control points. That means the DOT can control traffic and flows at 350 different locations. And every corridor in the nation has essentially been managed like this. Um, so you make a forecast of what traffic will be based on historical data, and based on that, you optimize your flow. 
This infrastructure is absolutely not capable of handling the changing demand due to the mobile internet that essentially results from this revolution we've seen over the last um, less than 10 years. So think about classical planning. You know, you go to any city in the world, um, essentially you'll have a four-step model or something similar, very antique, um, relying on census data that gives you a notion of historical demand, and that's how you provide um, you know, a forecast of your network loading, either solving a user equilibrium or dynamic traffic assignment. Every city in the world produces their carbon, their CO2 estimates yearly like this. Um, this is absolutely not representative of the way people move anymore. And while it might have been a really good model, uh, and in particular the Nash equilibrium that is underlying this solution, might have been a really good model of um, the, PP, the way people behaved in the past because they learned slowly. Over time, they understood what's best for them, and then the system was more or less at equilibrium. Nowadays, the system is never at equilibrium anymore and will never be at equilibrium ever again. So we can't, we can't even keep up with the way the system is evolving to model it. And that's very interesting because if you think of all the assets that we have to manage that infrastructure, we need to create new paradigms to be able to uh, connect these assets so that can be responsive to that changing demand that will keep evolving based on all the new apps that are um, that are um, uh, available to us. We heard from Sarah earlier that 80% of the data is owned by the private sector for a good reason, is because you are contributing to it through the apps. So that system essentially falls apart. And, needs, and this is, in a sense, probably another 10 years of work for all of us, for people at IDSS and many other places, to understand how we're going to develop the proper models to, to understand what's happening and, and cure for it. Um, you know, giving one particular example for routing, which I really like to talk about, is um, the three best routes of Google that you all get when you query your destination on the phone. Essentially, and now some of you use Waze, some use Google, some use Apple, some use Inrix, everybody has their favorite app, all owned by the private sector. All these companies will essentially route a fraction of you through different ways. None of this data is available to the government. Of course, the companies will never share the data because that's essential to their business. And we don't even know the algorithms running under the hood. And these algorithms keep changing every six months. So imagine the pace at which all of us collectively would have to model this to be able to devise a good solution. It is a real challenge. Um, and for example, in the case of Los Angeles, uh, it's interesting because people thought that by using apps that route you in a more efficient manner, you improve traffic. Of course, that's completely wrong. We know this from basic uh, economics theory with Nash. Um, uh, equilibria in particular, um, but what's interesting, and by the way, this is not just in Southern California, it's also happening here, um, but what's, what's interesting is that at the end of the day, um, the use of this technology might really be damaging, and so in Los Angeles, you see people revolting against the use of Waze because, for example, every Uber driver um, is using Waze. Um, we work with them, we love them, we've been um, working with them for many, many years. Uh, but um, uh, they essentially associate the traffic jams in their neighborhood two ways. Um, the, to the point that they end, hire senior citizens to walk uh, on the street with ways running on the phone uh, to pretend they are caught stuck in traffic because the algorithm learns that. And by the way, um, we, we cannot know whose fault it is because the point is Waze or Enrix or Google or whoever, I mean, that data is not subpoenable. And so this really goes back to the call of action that, that, that Sarah launched earlier is that if we want to create an ecosystem of smart cities in which um, we can improve things, um, there needs to be open platforms for data. There needs to be ways for, not ways the company, there needs to be ways for the government uh, to understand how things um, can be improved. Um, if, for example, um, and I'm just picking on ways, but I mean, it's true for every possible company in this field, for example, if the adoption rate of a specific app um, was uh, um, increased by 15%, which will happen in, in six or 18 months uh, to 18 months, depending on the place where you're in the US. Essentially, you can see dramatic decreases in travel time, potentially on the freeway, but, it, but dramatic increases in travel time in the arterial network. And so this is something that we can't even model because the adoption rates could be even faster than it takes to develop such models. And so in conclusion, really the, the one thing that I would like all of us to um, think about is that if you think of all the decisions we make with respect to our mobility, the span of time scales that the range over is quite enormous. Places where we live, um, uh, uh, for example, the land use and buying a house, I mean, we're talking decades. 
how business grow. Think about the Google campus in the South Bay um, that over the last decade grew by 20,000 people, or Treasure Island is going to have an eight, extra 18,000 people living in it, or the Tesla factory, again, in the South Bay, 4,000 people. Now, this takes a couple of years. The modes of transportation, every year or so, you reassess whether you should go by bus, by car, by bike, or whatever. Then the routing, every couple hours, you think, you check traffic to figure out how um, uh, how you should go to your destination. And finally, every couple minutes, you recheck your traffic because you might take a different route. And then there's feedback loops on top of it because whatever app you're using has algorithms that keep changing. We have to think about all these time scales and all the human factors and all the economics factors um, that are uh, essentially integrated in the way the system is evolving to understand how we're going to improve mobility um, in smart cities. And that's why I'm really excited by um, the agenda of IDSS because all of the fields that are required, uh, it's not going to be a single field and a single shot to solve this. To solve that problem, you essentially have to do modeling and mathematics and economics and urban planning and many other fields that are essential to the agenda of IDSS. So again, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. And uh, I think we're going to move to the yes. questions. Yes. Yes.